Welcome back. Wow, you came back for a second episode of Full Tray. Tony and I are very grateful. What a kind person you are. Whether you subscribe to our channel or you're finding it for the first time, this is Full Tray at the Chicken Nugget Buffet, a weekly recap show that we broadcast on YouTube where we, Tony Mendez and I, go through the last episodes of Adventures in Design from the week prior. Uh, we pull out the best chicken nuggets, give you the specific timestamps so you can get right there, hear it right from the horse's mouth. Yes, I just called Mark Bricky a horse. It wasn't in a negative way. It was more in like, uh, you're a powerful tool for me to get somewhere faster type way. A workhorse, you could say. <laughs> yeah, you, you could very much say. Um, though some would argue with all those Disneyland trips. We don't know how hard. Um, so we go through, we pull out those best moments and help you narrow down hours of content to find some of the best stuff, and then we explain why that could be so important. Uh, so uh, this week was another solid helping of everything. Uh, we're just going to go right into it. The very first episode we'll talk about is AID 595. That is Shop Talk with Sean Mort. Uh, this is a Circle of Trust only episode, so if you aren't a member, you're going to have to sign up if you want to hear where this stuff all comes from. Uh, and we'll start out the... The timestamp I pulled out was at 52 minutes and 25 seconds. It's when Mark starts talking about uh, the Apple up, like how he pays for new equipment throughout the year. He and his wife, Beth, trade off and they, they figure out, okay, we I get a new computer, you get a new computer, I get a new laptop, you get one. They do that every four years. Uh, and this, the taking out the credit card thing, that that's one part of it. Look at how someone reverse engineers buying something that's great. but. More importantly, and this is something I think a lot of people overlook, is buying that type of equipment, having the latest stuff, that's part of your job. That is equipment you need to have. It's almost as essential as if you didn't have a police officer uniform and you were a cop. You need to have that type of stuff. And whether you use Mark's method of pulling out a credit card and then paying it off over 10 months, whether you set aside a certain amount of money every month or a certain amount of money that you get off each job and then you essentially buy this stuff, it's a big price point. No one just has a couple thousand laying around to get a new, you know, MacBook Pro. You need to be aware that those are things you're going to have to one replace regularly. You know, every few years your laptop is officially outdated. You don't have any way to get in there and kind of update it. You just have to start over. So keep that in mind and just set aside that type of money because it's hard to come by. And unless you're really planning ahead for it, odds are you're going to hit a hurdle. And uh, if you're going to pull out a credit card, I know Mark threw out the Best Buy one, get some miles, man. Find a credit card that'll, you know, at least get you a plane ticket to somewhere else just because you spent money with them. So, you know, be worth your while. No, that was a really good segment just because I'm actually recording on a 2007 iMac. So uh, I'm about to, that, I would say. Just because not everyone might be aware. What year is it now? Uh, 2017. Uh -huh, so okay. yeah, that's like a 10 year uh, refresh, I guess you could say. So I'm about due. Um, but no, I was like uh, totally uh, in tune with what Mark was saying. And especially because they just refreshed the iMac line and I was totally ready to buy one the last refresh. And now it's like they sweeten the pot. So uh, for me, I was just like, yeah, that sounds perfect. Um, I, I totally agree with everything you had to say. Um, I don't have a Best Buy credit card, but it's something I might look into. Yeah, well, uh, you know, there are a lot of tools to, like, figure out what credit cards you can, like, already get coming your way. Yeah. You know, there's some online stuff. Um, and I'm not totally for credit cards. I mean, they're essentially just waiting for you to fuck up. That's how credit card companies work. I don't like that. I don't like that feeling. Um, but yeah, as long like, I mean, really, if you are going to do a credit card, pay attention to that reverse engineering. How it says, all right, just figure it out. How much do you have to pay every 10 months? And that's a great way to also not lose a huge chunk of money all at once. And you can use that money for other things. And then every month you just pay off small amounts. And then going back to what you were saying, how, I mean, it's equipment, but it's also a tool. And it's very true for everybody in this field, regardless of whether you're uh, an illustrator or you do uh, all computer work or whatever. I mostly work with pencil and paper and pen and ink, but at the end of the day, at some point, I'm going to need that next step, that next tool to to get me to the to where I need to be. So right, um, so some of that impressions too. You know, when you go to meet with a client, if you're pulling out like a really old laptop that looks clunky, 
it's just not a good look for you. They're going to want, you know, like people can't help but judge and they're going to wonder what's what's going on with this guy. Like, why does he have this? They, they It builds confidence when they see you have relatively new stuff. When you have the latest type of things, like that's what people want to, you know, when, if you were to buy a car and you go to a really old car lot, in the back of your head, you're like, I could probably talk this guy down a couple bucks because he doesn't seem to have everything together. And if you walk into a brand new Tesla store, you're like, oh, shit, I'm out of my element. I'll just do what they tell me. And that's something to keep in mind from a client perspective, too. You know, they look at that type of stuff. So what you're saying is I should stop going into meetings with my spiral notebook and like <laughs> just showing them my little drawings in there and then switch over to like something more professional like an iPad. I got it. I'm saying if you're going to do that, just make it work for you. You know, maybe like, hey, I'm more of a traditional illustrator, so I like to kind of go old school before the meeting starts. You know? Okay, I am poor, so yeah, it's paper. So. <laughs> See, that um, is one way to do it. You got to spin that shit, man. You can't just say I'm poor. It's true. It's very true. Um, but I would say my chicken nugget came in right at the 20-minute mark, um, and it was essentially Mark was talking about what does true success look like, um, regardless of money that's associated with it? Uh, you know, emotional success. I think he was talking about how he went to see his doctor, and his doctor was kind of not doing so much the uh, physical checkup, but also a mental checkup. Like, how are you doing? How do you like your job? What's going on? So I think there's a lot involved um, with being successful. That's it's, it's not always monetary. It's uh, your your well being. So if you're happy doing what you're doing, then that's great. But I mean, if stuff gets a little too too stressful and you're working yourself to the bone, I mean, and that's no fun either. So you have to find a good balance between those things. So I thought that was kind of a good uh, point that he was making. Obviously, Mark is doing fine because he's at Disneyland every day. So. Yeah, yeah, he really puts up a lot of proof that he's uh, elsewhere. Um, Got to watch that, dude. Come on. Uh, and it is a struggle everybody has. Uh, even when you're mentioning that, I couldn't help but think of the, uh, I forget the name of which Steve Jobs movie it is since there are a couple, but it's the one with Benedict Cumberbatch, the real one, not Ashton Kutcher. That doesn't count. That He's not a real actor. He doesn't take on real roles. Wait, there was a Benedict Cumberbatch Apple movie? I thought it was... Um... Steve Jobs. No, man, you're wrong. I think it's just called Jobs. No, it's... Um... Oh, man, I've got podcast brain. Uh, no, it's... Uh... The guy from Alien Covenant. I, I don't have you on that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Doctor Strange. It's not. It's totally not. You're totally wrong. Cool. Uh, well, Anyways, that's what, that's any of you jerks that watch this movie, feel free to comment below. Let us know that I'm wrong. That's fine. Either way, he, uh, you know, it's like you watch him kind of struggle with the work-life balance. And then I just know personally uh, that later on, this isn't in the film, but like Steve Jobs like, shit, I did everything wrong. Like, I shouldn't have placed work so far ahead of family, friends, meaningful things. And that, that is that measure of success that we're talking about. You know, that it's not just about how much money you've made and it helps. It helps to have a lot of money. I, I like you rarely see people with a sad face when they're riding around on a jet ski that they own. They're having a pretty good time. Um, you, you just have to realize that there is more going on that you're going it's a culmination of everything. Yes, you want success at your work, but you also want success at home. You also want success in your health. It, you can't just focus on this one thing because you will burn out and you won't have the fulfillment you actually were looking for in the first place. So yeah, good good call out on that one. That's It's easy to get lost and like I have to get professionally more efficient at what I'm doing or, or improve my skills. So, And Michael Fassbender. Uh, yeah, fuck it. God damn it. I hope YouTube doesn't care. They they don't. They it's don't. weird shit. Who knows? Um, so yeah, uh, moving on. Uh, the next one, AID 596. This is the next installment of the collection with Huck Gee. This is when uh, every month they take a look at the vinyl toy world, the designer toy world. They bring out somebody from that. They all sit down. They have a nice little chat. This time it was James Groman who has been in the game for quite a long time, somebody who helped invent Mad Balls, somebody who worked at Hasbro and Play School on some of the toys that have come out for the world of Star Wars. And he just won everything at the Five Points Festival for Designer Toy of the Year with King Corpse. Really cool person to get a life story from, to hear a lot about what he's gone through and what he's done. 
Um, and then Mark and Huck are there too. <laughs> Tony, you can uh, start this one out. Yeah. Um, I mean, how cool is that? The guy essentially like designed my childhood. So <laughs> right. Yeah. It's... Like that's amazing. But I would have to say, uh, my talking point came in at the 26 minute and 45 second mark. Um, essentially, it was Mark and James kind of talking about uh, building something um, with somebody that believes in you and what you're doing, and they're, they've got your back. And you know, uh, James was kind of talking about how you know early on in his, his career, he was really lucky because he got to work with people who could see his vision and see what he wanted to do. And then when he got uh, through with that, he realized like, oh, it's not that way everywhere. So um, yeah. it is nice yeah. having that. <laughs> No, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's it's just it's that, that feeling. Even if it's just like um, somebody who's not involved in a project at all, and they just drop in on like, "Hey, man, that was I think you did a really good job." It means that much more, and it kind of like puts you over the top and makes you feel that much better. So it's really important to to, to get that connection with somebody who can kind of see uh, what you're trying to do. So. Yeah, it it's 100% something to shoot for and it hurts when it's not there. And sometimes you've already taken the job. You've already said yes. And you're like, this one might not be as fun. And that's fine too sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, when someone's in your corner from the get go, it, it helps the entire thing move along when they're excited about it. And then there's also, it, it kind of like makes you a little more, a little less, wait, which way is this going to be? I'm going to say risk adverse. So does that mean it makes you more, less risk adverse? Because you're going to take chances, like with the work, right? You're you feel a little freed up. That if this person believes in you, cool. Let me use my mind. Let me use my creativity to really take this a few more steps than normal, as opposed to just getting through it. You know, yeah. and that happens when someone's like, "Hey, I love your work. I'm excited about working with you. We came to you because of this." It it all lines up, and and that's really the product of a few things. One, the image you put forth. You know, whatever you have up online that they're looking at if they see a cohesive image of what you do, that's how they get excited about that stuff. That's how they're like, look at what this person does. And then they come to you for that and already they're in your corner. And, and that's invaluable. And I think you could say the same thing with you and Mark. I think um, you're the number one cheerleader for the show. And um, you know, you're gonna tell Mark, uh, you know, what you think is a good idea, what you think is a bad idea. So you're always that positive guy in his corner that he can rely on to help move the show forward. And we're seeing a lot of that. So I think, um, I think you definitely need that in your life. So I'm glad Mark was able to find you and, uh, and you could, you could see the progression of the show. It keeps getting better and better. So yeah, I think you could apply to that too. So. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, for me in 596, uh, the chicken nugget I pulled out is at one hour. Uh, this is when James Groman kind of talks a little bit about struggling with some artistic depression. Just kind of when you land that big job, when you're at that dream gig or you're working around some people you really respect. He was talking about being in the room with some mega talents. The sort of doubt that can warm its way into your heart or work its way into your head and you just think that you're out of your league, you don't belong there and you you withdraw and it really is playing off what you're saying earlier when someone believes in you how it kind of it helps you do this work and this is the exact opposite of that and it happens to all of us it's gonna occur i mean if you look at james groman's career he's done so much and you can't help but look at it and, and think what a great artist he is and hearing those types of things from these people of knowing that they struggle with the same things you do it doesn't make it go away I know the next time I'm in an environment like that, I will internally freak out a little bit and you have to calm yourself down. But knowing that it happens to other people normalizes it a little bit and allows you to talk yourself down from that ledge a little quicker and get right back to work. And that's what he talks about is it, it's hard to do it. And maybe not all your ideas make it through, but there can be elements of it that make it through. And that's where your real success comes in these types of situations is that you did contribute. And how can you expect to be the only one? You're not going to just deliver a concept in a room of 10 other people that are all there with you and expect yours to just go through unhindered, unchanged. So just you have to change your mindset in that regard when you're in those types of situations. Yeah, and I think um, a term that gets thrown around on the show a lot is imposter syndrome, which is a very real thing, and uh, everybody has it. I mean, you, you can't—you always have that level of self-doubt where you're just like, oh, 
this sucks or why am I doing this? I'm not that good or whatever. And it's on all levels. I mean, I've, I've heard it from people that Mark's interviewed where you're just like, Oh my God, this person's in like the top 10 of, of the scene, you know? So if they're saying that and I'm here, then what does that mean? Like, so everybody suffers from some sort of version of that and no, but it's totally true. Yeah. It's a, it's really interesting to hear. And especially from a guy like that. I mean, he had a hand in Care Bears, which is like, <laughs> I would love, like, just to be like, oh, yeah, you know what I did? I worked on Care Bears, like, only one of the biggest properties of the 80s. So, uh, yeah, that's it's pretty crazy to hear somebody like that. It's just like, oh, no, yeah, I have that, too. So, N- Not everyone goes around bragging about Care Bears, though, you know? There's I would totally brag thing. about Care Bears. <laughs> I would totally, I'd be the first one. Like, do you know how I worked on Care Bears? <laughs> it yeah. takes a real man to brag about Care Bears for sure. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen? It's going to come back. They're going to reboot it, and it's going to be like bigger and badder than ever. So that's like that's the train you want to be on. It's like the <laughs> Apple i like their Apple refresh because you know every ten years they're going to be like, oh hey, you know what we haven't done a lot of Care Bears. Sounds like you're already throwing your hat in your ring to be a contributor there. You're hoping that just the Care Bears universe stumbles on this episode. I'm, I'm going to start making a lot of things to say about Care Bears. Care Bears <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, the next episode up is Addy 597. This is the May poster countdown. Uh, this is where Mark gets in Mitch Putnam, who works on the vacuum, who works at Mondo, and in this case, most importantly, runs omgposters.com. They go through the entire month of May in this one, and they pull out the top 10 posters from that. They also have a little side treasure chest of things they'll pull out, and Mark and Mitch go through everything. They give you a lot of behind the scenes of some of the business aspects of the posters, talk about some of the things the illustrators went through, and why the piece is so great, be it composition, color, uh, any of those sort of aspects that you like to apply. These are always incredible episodes because it gives you a lot of insight as to how other people might see your work. If you can kind of put yourself in those artist's shoes, a lot of times, even the best pieces, I mean, even all these top tens, sometimes there are little nuggets of like, oh, this one, we kind of had to change this, or they got pushback from our clients on this. And it's very, it's crucial information because a lot of times when you're used to creating in a vacuum and not getting that feedback too often, you need to know what it's really like at a com- at all levels of this profession. You know, from, I'm just like, I mean, Tony, you didn't get any pushback from anybody at Twin Peaks. You made that on your own. But what if you were really working with them? Like what types of things would they say in Mitch's, Mitch has had so much experience doing that. It's, it's incredible to hear what he has to say. Um, for me, um, I'm pulling out a chicken nugget that's at 30 minutes and eight seconds. This isn't even one of the top 10. This is something from the treasure chest. It's the King Kong poster that Chris Thornley did. And I think Mark and Mitch touch on some pretty important things here uh, where they sort of talk about how the execution is what kills an incredible concept. So in this image, It's a top-down view of King Kong hanging onto a building with some planes swirling around. And there are a lot of great elements of this poster. They they mention that. And then they talk about how his actual execution, the rendering of the piece itself, makes it fall apart. It's very, very important to keep in mind that even the best ideas can't be saved when the talent behind it isn't there. Um, And this isn't in his style i mean you can look at someone like leslie herman who they also talk about in that uh countdown he has a very loose style he has a very deliberate style that that isn't about technical proficiency but there is a style there and so they're really touching on how again mark mentions the rendering is what makes this fall apart and there are lots of little tiny issues you can see in that they talk about how king kong looks like he's kind of xeroxed onto the side of a building that's something to keep in mind as you're making these illustrations to use little tips to make everything look like it's all a part of the same image. So people use things like light source, but you know, a way he could have really easily eliminated that problem is through overlap by putting in part of King Kong a little bit behind the building. So it looks like he's interacting with the scene and not so much pasted right on top. Uh, they talk about how the girl that he's holding in his hand looks very flat. He didn't add any of the, same dithered shadow technique that he does on the buildings. Uh, And he also didn't really do that on the plane. So reflecting 
different illustrative techniques is another way that everything sort of unifies together and makes it all look like a similar piece. So I'd recommend going to check that out. Really look at the piece as Mark and Mitch talk about it. And you can start applying a lot of those things to your own work as well and eliminate some of these steps right up front. And, uh, and lastly, to, something to touch on is they do mention, this is something an art director could have stepped in and saved. And maybe you don't have an art director. That's not a big deal. This is why you show it to other people. You know, show it to your mom just so you can see what she thinks about it. Or maybe since it's Father's Day, show it to your dad. Get, throw him a bone. See what he thinks. Show to a couple peers. Get their honest reaction because maybe they can mention some of those things to you. Hey, King Kong doesn't really look like he belongs in that scene. Or these planes, they're so much larger than King Kong, and he's the focal point. Is that really the message you're trying to send? Uh, th there are lots of great topics. And this poster itself is just one example of why the, sh the poster countdowns are just filled with chicken nuggets. Yeah, and I think it was obviously it was a very constructive criticism. They weren't shitting all over it. It was just a matter of like, I think Mark uh, brought up the fact that if you would have brought this to him as like the comp, he'd been like, oh, that's great, excellent, go ahead and move forward with it. But as a finished piece, it is uh, unfortunately lacking a little bit. But no, I, I totally get what they're saying. And I think that's why I know I enjoy the poster countdown. It's probably one of my favorite shows just because you get to hear all of that insight, especially coming from somebody like Mitch who while he doesn't um, do anything uh, specifically except for uh, kind of uh, guide some of these posters through to, to their final, uh, I guess, composition, um, he's, still, he's still really good at it. And um, so it's always really cool to hear his insight. Um, but I would have to say uh, my talking point came in just before that, like uh, probably 21 minutes and 50 seconds. Um, essentially, Mark was talking about um, having a unique perspective, a unique idea that you can bring to the table to take something that people have seen a million times and then stop it, you know, have them stop in their tracks and go, oh, wow, this, this is something special. And I think that's kind of what um, initially drew me to the poster scene was when Mondo was doing stuff back, I think I started collecting back in 2008, I'd never seen any movie posters that looked like that. So yeah. it was taking stuff that I'd seen over and over and over again and putting that unique spin on it that made it that much more special and made me go, oh, man, I have to have this on my wall or what have you. So it's really important to kind of um, take that into account, um, especially uh, coming up with a composition. So similar to the King Kong thing, it's all about execution and, and how you can put your take on it and not just have it look like everything else. So I think that's a really important thing. Um, that should be, uh, you know, the focal point of what you, whatever you're doing. So I thought that was a really good point. Yeah, and, and almost a tie together between what we've been touching on yeah. a lot, even in this episode of confidence, of imposter syndrome. You keep mentioning, like, your take on it, and, and th that's what you're pulling out of this. And it, that's really the thing to hone in on. If you're doing something for pop culture, there – there's a moment in these films that you kind of naturally gravitate towards that you personally naturally gravitate towards. And while sometimes you might think, Ooh, this might sum up the film better visually. Sometimes those moments that you gravitate towards, if you choose to illustrate those moments, there are people out there that gravitated towards that same moment. And yeah. when they see that work that you made, they'll be like, Holy shit. That's what that movie means to me. And then you got yourself a sale. Again, I know we always touch on your Twin Peaks poster, but this is one of the reasons I wanted you on the show is I like to, you know, like you chose the hotel overlooking the mountain scene and the waterfall. Yeah. I've never seen Twin Peaks, as I mentioned earlier, so I don't yeah. know where that fucking comes from. But of hours of content, you pick that moment to distill it down to. And that might, it doesn't have all the floating heads. I mean, I know you even kind of mentioned like Mondo's doing things in movie posters that you're not used to seeing. We're used to just the floating heads and every fucking, you, even with that new Spider-Man Homecoming, man, what a fucking stupid move to just try to sum up the, the entire film in one thing. What is, what is somebody drawn towards? What, right. what gets somebody excited and doesn't even give away the whole story. We don't have to do that. And uh, yeah, so, be confident in that sometimes. Uh, I, I did a Mighty Ducks poster with Violent Gentlemen. And there are lots of moments to pull out that you can look for. I thought when they 
I always love that scene when they told the vice, like they had the substitute teacher and they just keep yelling like quack and then they have to write, I will not write quack at the vice principal. That's the moment I went with. It doesn't show a hockey rink. It doesn't show that yeah. big final moment of that nerdy kid finally realizing he might be able to make the goal or, you know, it, it just touches on this moment that in a way sums up everything. You know it's the Mighty Ducks partially because it has to fucking say it, but you also know it's the Mighty Ducks. You're like, oh yeah, I remember when they wrote that thing. That was funny. That was a cool moment. And that's the that's the concept they chose. I, I showed them other concepts. I showed them different things that could sum up the movie, but they gravitated towards that moment too. And they're like, yeah, this works. So don't be afraid to throw that stuff out there. You might get beat down a couple times. It might not always make it through, but it doesn't make it wrong. You just didn't find the right person that you know hit that same moment. Yeah, you don't need Coach Bombay front and center to make a good Mighty Ducks poster. <laughs> no, you don't. Real. But that, the other thing, too, is like they mentioned uh, their number one pick was uh, Jessica Siemens' uh, Phenomena poster, which is fantastic. And I've never seen the movie, but that poster made me stop and go, I want to see that movie. Yeah. Just because the art is so good. And that's, that's a big point, too, is like – if you can get somebody who, like you said, with, with the Twin Peaks, you never watched it. You don't know what the deal is. But if you can get somebody to just go, oh, whoa, what's this? That's yeah. kind of a big thing, too. It so. drew me in. It made me interested. Yeah. because, And again, like you mentioned, no one's ever shown it from that perspective. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of art out there about Twin Peaks past the actual official art. <clears throat> what you did, I was like, what's going on here? This kind of like, for me, it was like, this is like a Shining type thing, huh? Like there's just this hotel all secluded away. I could be totally wrong. Again, I've never seen it. I'm just saying my reaction to the piece you made specifically yeah. intrigued me. It didn't just say Twin Peaks. You know, sometimes people can look at your work and a lot of times when you're 100% literal, that's where some people stop. They look at it. Oh, this is a poster for Twin Peaks and they move on. If you had said that, if you just had some person's face, they might not have thought, well, what's really going on in here? Yeah. So... Keep that in mind when you're making your own work. Again, I know this is talking about overcoming imposter syndrome and it's what has been the sort of running theme, but don't be afraid to do it. Grow a pair. Talk about what you think. And you'll be surprised at how many other people feel the same way. I think we have to give a quick shout out to, to our boy James Flames for his uh, gig poster he did, Hannah's G. Clay. They looked phenomenal. But you could totally see what Mitch was saying that – the uh, G Clay doesn't do the screen printing medium any justice because holy smokes, that guy has gone next level with his art. Yeah. Incredible stuff. And I mean, to unpack that a little bit, it was, it is at the end of the day, to me, I also think it's an odd business choice to release them both at the same time when Mitch, when they're kind of like, you know, doing some cosplay as James's agent, Mitch mentioned, you know, I would have done the screen printed poster first and then one year later released the G Clay and said something like, hey, I went back to revisit a favorite moment with this new style. Because, yeah, they mentioned that, you know, that art print doesn't do the screen print any justice whatsoever because it's there's so much more richness and depth. It's not about the fact that Primus is on the bottom of the poster. It's that James made this really beautiful, detailed piece and then simplified it down to fit the process of screen printing. And even within that, did it have to be screen printed then? You know, you uh, one of the things across a lot of Adventures in Designs episodes is you saw Mark warm up to G. Clay's. At first, he was like, I'm screen prints or nothing. And then he sort of realized, and this is the most important factor of this, the audience, the people you're trying to sell to, they don't totally care. They don't care that it's screen printed or not. Their only reaction is to the piece itself and that they want it hung up on their wall, that it's in a poster format. But they don't care if you went out, if you burned all the screens, if you pulled the ink onto it, or if you just sent it to someone and said, print this shit up. They don't care. So what? how do you really want to make art? If you want to do screen printing, cool, do that. Work within that medium. There are lots of great success that came from that. But you don't have to. And there's nothing wrong with doing both either the way James Flame did. He's really showing what each thing is capable of. But next to each other, it makes screen printing look like a very limited form of expression when compared to using every color in the book. I'm sure if you give um, his cheek to somebody um, a little bit more, a little bit of experience with, with that stuff, they could probably do it in CMYK or something and make it work or do a variation of it, which Mitch was kind right. of touching on. 
Um, so it's there. It's just it's, it's the the work and that next step. So yeah, it, it honestly would be really interesting to hear James's rationale behind doing both behind making such a large discrepancy between the two as well. Um, you almost, you know, I wonder which, which way he did it first. Did he use the screen printing version to almost make sort of like the forms and the line work? And then he said, all right, now let's take this next level. Or did he take it next level? He did everything he did. And then he said, all right, let's pull it back. How do I convert this into screen printing? And then made more of the key line look that the other one has. It'd be really interesting to hear his aspect of that. So James, just come on a shop talk again. Fuck, we want to hear from you, jerk. Uh, um, and speaking of shop talks, the last episode from this week, AID 598, it's one more traditional shop talk with Billy Bauman. Um, and this one, Mark and Billy kind of do it old school and they just jam out for a little bit. They go over a lot of different things like uh, Delicious just did a Dave Matthews poster. They talk about kind of dealing with the ricks from marketing in the world and lots of other things. Uh, Tony? What'd you find? Yeah. Um, my chicken nugget came in at the 36 minute and 47 second mark um, and segues perfectly into what we were talking about. Um, essentially, Mark was talking how uh, color separating has become the new art form um, in the yeah. scene. And it's totally true. And Billy brings up the point of um, Jason Edmiston. The guy is a traditional painter. He um, didn't know any of this stuff to start off with. He worked with Rob Jones, who kind of show him the ropes and he's been able to take this uh, limited medium and print some amazing posters that look nearly identical to his actual full paintings. Yeah. And just real quick. If you guys haven't seen a real Jason Emerson piece in person, once you get the opportunity, fucking do it, go up to that booth, get real close, make it real weird with that poster, get real close and look at how he does his dither technique. All right, back to you. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's uh, it, it's incredible. So, um, and it's something where uh, me, because I'm just an illustrator and I, I don't really work that much um, digitally just yet. Um, it was nice going to Billy's class with the double at over at Delicious and learning a lot of those steps um, that you need to take in order to get that stuff ready for the screen printing media. Um, so it's. Uh, it's a lot of work, and I think it's something that everybody should learn if that's what they're interested in, if, that, if that's what they're pursuing, the screen printing. I think everybody should um, devote the time and effort to learn um, those techniques and how the medium works and how it can work for you. So, 100%. If that's the output that you're choosing to do, you should know top to bottom, not only tried and true techniques, but what are people experimenting with? What's Kevin Tong up to over there, and how is he – revolutionizing the medium. What is, you know, um, they kind of talked about some of the innovators that have really changed some of screen printing in the, uh, the poster countdown episode, you know, like Daniel Danger's style didn't exist in the poster scene until he showed up. Jason Edmondson's style didn't exist in the poster scene the way he does it until he showed up. So understand how people screen print. Think about different ways your art can push that medium and you'll be the one that, People mention in these types of moments right now as well. So yeah, great, great catch. Um, for me, the chicken nugget I'm pulling out is at 27 minutes and five seconds. This is when Billy and Mark start talking about being confident enough to make your own creative decisions. And when you work for yourself, that you get that type of, uh, that type of career fulfillment because you know that you're the one saying this is the way I think it should be. And then they touch on, I know recently I mentioned how James Groman got beat down uh, and how, you know, he, it was really intimidating to be in a room of mega talent. And in this episode, it's weird that I gravitated towards Billy saying when he was working at this advertising agency and how they keep just shitting on it. And they're like, this isn't, you know, what we want. The client wants this and it will happen. I also worked at an ad agency. I was there for a little over a year and what I saw in the creative director that was there, all I kept thinking was if I stay here, if I do design in this world, I'm gonna end up like him. And he was not happy. He was designing for approval. And that was the big thing that they were that they touched on that I resonated with in this episode. And again, 27 minutes and five seconds is when this all starts. They talk about how people can shift their mindset after they get shit on a lot to just make work that they know will get approved. It might not be right. It might not be what the client really needs, but they're just gonna do that. And it sucks, man. It really sucks. Particularly in this world when people are like, 
I'm going to be here because this is my dream job. This is what I want to do. And then in actuality, you're just putting together Legos that someone else told you to do it. You're not really being creative. And that's where a lot of people can get burnt out. You heard Billy talk about it. Billy, a mega talent that has his own boutique design agency, used to work at an advertising agency, used to get shit on. So if you're in that position, keep that in mind. Billy was there. And now he's gone on to do lots of incredible stuff with Delicious, worked with some huge entities, worked with Bud Light and Netflix. He really climbed up the ladder and he did it his own way. <clears throat> but it doesn't come easy. And a lot of times when you're in different situations, it might not come to you at all. Uh, one thing that this creative director did when I was at the ad agency, <clears throat> and this kind of touches on designing for approval, he told me, he's like, David, I want you to design one the way you design it exactly. Whatever your take is, I want you to take that. I want you to do it the way you do it. Then I want you to look at the last three ads that I did for this client, and I want, them, I want you to make one just like that. And then I want you to make one that's in the middle of the two. He knew they were never going to pick what I thought was the design option. He knew it. They never did. They always picked the one that, you know, the one that I made look like his other ones. Yeah. But he, he understood. He's like, it really sucks to just create for approval. So let's give David this sliver of hope that it might get through, which again, it never did, but it was really kind of an important step. Yeah. I was, I still got to be like, Hey, this is what I, I want to do. And you know what? He always complimented me. He said, great job. This looks awesome. He knew what was coming. He really did. Again, he was, he was dead inside. He didn't like to create anymore. Well, I think Billy even mentions too, that like, it's kind of, uh, good having that experience just because you it kind of builds your character in a way so yeah. I, I think everybody uh, I mean I, I haven't gone through that yet but I, I could totally uh, empathize and see how yeah sometimes I mean you just need to get your work done and uh, it doesn't matter what it looks like as long as they're happy and you know push it through yeah but, they, do, they do talk about finding a balance right that yeah, yeah. some jobs you're like shit we just got to do this and there are other ones where you kind of get to flex your creative muscle a little more and that's you know when you really want to revel in that, and that touches back into having a client that believes in you. Yeah. Uh, there is a pretty decent through line on not only this episode of Full Trade, but this week of Adventures in Design uh, of finding that confidence, trusting your creative voice, and then hoping that everyone else sees it too. Um, so yeah, Tony, what'd you find? Wait, we already did that. No, nope. yeah, yeah, we already did that. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> we're, sorry, this is the end, all right? This has been you know, 30 minutes of me trying to be a ringleader. I'm not the greatest at it yet. Oh, you're good. I, and uh, that was a short, I think that was a shorter episode too, wasn't it? The shop talk. It was because uh, they were getting ready for the workshop week next week. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, it was an hour long. Uh, there was no circle of trust only. So <laughs> everybody gets a little bonus. It's just one hour, pure shop talk, but a lot of solid stuff to really uh, absorb. So hopefully Tony and I helped uh, narrow down a few of the better moments. Maybe you realize like, shit, I should go back and listen to that episode. Or maybe I should just go back and listen to that segment and really hone in on what they're talking about. Uh, as smart as Tony and I are, a lot of times when you hear the people say it exactly, maybe with our perspective and what they said, that can hit it home a little more for you and realize the type of important stuff that is found in every episode of Adventures in Design. As you're listening through, uh, if you happen to have other moments that you think are great, feel free in the comments below to mention, hey, this is another good moment. You guys passed up on that. Uh, the hardest part, I think, I don't know if it's for you, Tony, but the hardest part for me is really finding one moment that I think shines true over the other ones. I mean, obviously we're picking our favorites, but I mean, there's like four or five other moments in every episode that I'm debating between shit, which one should I talk about on the show? Yeah, and the flow too, because it's so easy to just get lost listening to the episode and then going, oh yeah, I need to be picking stuff out because all oh, it's good. It, there's always something you can pick up on. Um, right. But no, and, and I mean, I'm really looking forward. David totally sold me on next week. The, the workshop episodes sound incredible. So there's a lot to look forward to. Listening to this yeah. Podcast. And, uh, you know, I've already, again, um, I didn't mention this early in the show, but I'm the producer of adventures in design. So if you don't know me, that's who I am, which also means I get to listen to some of these episodes early. So I've already been pounding through a lot of those workshops and starting next week, it's a circle of trust only week where there are five different workshops that Mark goes through with uh, probably most importantly designers and artists that have been on adventures in design that we've all kind of come to know and trust. And they share a lot of their tactics about what has made them so successful in certain areas. Uh, the first one is how you save money as a freelancer. That's uh, Mark sits down with Sean and they go over how you set aside money 
when you're kind of in a really chaotic up and down, not sure where cash flow is coming from type world. Uh, next, he sits down with DK and G and they go over how to make a better portfolio. Nathan Goldman just did it uh, in online portfolio review, but uh, Mark's done a lot of portfolio reviews as has Dan and Nathan. And they share a lot of really important stuff, not only for how you design your portfolio for when you're going to apply for one specific job, but how you represent yourself online and what that says. Uh, I mean, portfolio has really expanded past the just leather bound book with 10 pieces that you flip through. There's so many different ways you need to represent yourself. So that's really an incredible resource. Uh, Jason Edmondson goes over all the stuff he does before he even starts to paint by doing reference photos with his dad and his wife, by studying lighting, uh, everything that we just kind of mentioned earlier and hearing that stuff. There's so much work that goes into the art before you even start to do anything. And it, it's just like making a, you know, a recipe or anything else. It's very easy for us to want to just leap to the finished piece. When we're trying to build a house, it's almost like some artists want to build the wall, paint the wall, hang photos on it, and they still haven't finished the kitchen. You know, you really have to build out the whole house first, get the basic structure down, then you can add a few more details. Then you can put drywall up. Then you can add a few more details. Then you can hang shit. Then you can put a few more details. Then you can buy your Alexa and make a smart home. Uh, you don't just leap right to the end. Uh, so what Jason goes over is awesome. Uh, DKNG comes back. This time uh, they and Mark go over a lot of different social media strategies. And again, this is a little bit more like the art before you start, but you have to have a plan for releasing this stuff. Like when you were doing your Twin Peaks image, there's so much other art that you can pull out and draw from and make an entire story that lasts for a month on this one piece. It's not just, here's a finished piece and we're done. Uh, but even then, outside of that, do you boost the post? Uh, what else can you do? So you get a lot of insight from that. And then the last workshop is uh, with Billy and that's where they go over how you actually present your work to a client. So of all these workshops, only one is on specifically creating art and the rest all kind of go around what what sort of like, you know, is the bread of that sandwich of the actual meat of your art, but like, how, how do you frame that? How do you take this? So Billy shows how delicious will present their work to clients because you can't just show them a thumbnail. You mentioned earlier, I shouldn't use my spiral bound notebook. Nothing wrong with using that in meetings. There is something wrong about that of trying to, you know, sell someone like pay me money and you're just showing them like, a sketch you did on that, right? Like you got to doctor it up a little bit. You got right. to print it out on something uh, nice. You have to put it into a little bit of a format so that all shows how professional you are. So yeah, that's another just great workshop. So there'll be five upcoming this week. Uh, we'll have another full tray. We'll be touching in. I'm sure that'll be even harder to pick out one moment, but uh, we'll be back next Sunday. Uh, Tony, you got anything in particular you want to plug or mention <laughs> plug uh i don't know <laughs> no i'm good i uh, i mean uh, outside sources is my instagram account that's usually where i post the most stuff and i haven't posted anything there recently hopefully soon um otherwise no i'm really looking forward to the workshop week it sounds amazing so sign up for the circle of trust because it's totally worth it yeah this would be a, a hell of a week to start doing that ten dollars a month a hundred dollars for the whole year kind of depends on which way you want to do it but not only to get access into these workshops but uh you know every episode that goes up almost every episode that goes up there's bonus content where everything continues for another 30 minutes 40 minutes 50 minutes so that just gives you a little more content every week you get access to i mean we're just about to hit episode 600 500 episodes are up in the archives it, there's so much that you can take and gain even if something of you're like, shit, I love Jason Edmiston, you can narrow down a search just for Jason Edmiston episodes and you can get all of that beautiful bald head that you need to get. Uh, so sign up today and uh, we'll be here next Sunday. Thanks for signing up for Full Tray. Uh, if you subscribe, it'll just automatically let you know when we do this. And if not, just know it goes up every Sunday. No big deal. Uh, thanks again. And again, comment below with any other chicken nugget timestamps that you have. Uh, this is... At the end of the day, I want this to be a good resource for people to go back and find moments within the episode really easily and be like, oh, shit, that is a good one. Oh, that's a good one, too. Thanks. Because one year from now, it might be really hard to go back to these episodes and find the things that are super important. So, you know, help us out. Throw up some comments. It'd be great. Thank you so much from Tony and I. We'll see you next week. And you guys take care.